you who, who missed the, the, the lead-in joke, uh, I'll, I'll repeat it now that the mic is on. How many software engineers does it take to change a light bulb? None. It's a hardware problem. All right. Good morning uh, and welcome. My name is Michael Radwin. I am a director of engineering at Intuit. Um, and I'm uh, going to be talking today about uh, something that we built internally called our Merchant Lookup Service, which we built on top of HBase and Lucene and MapReduce. You may not have heard of Intuit before um, because we, don't, we aren't very good about, about using our, our own brand name, but we use the brand names of our products a lot better, uh, Quicken, Mint, QuickBooks, TurboTax. So maybe you've used some of our products even if you didn't know that Intuit was the companies whose products you were using. So um, the problem I want to start by talking about today is, is merchant or vendor or business data. Um, we have a product called QuickBooks, which if any of you are a small business owner, and actually, in fact, raise your hand if you've uh, used QuickBooks before. Oh, awesome. OK, so great. So, you, so some of you are actually even familiar with the product. If you've ever used Quicken uh, and you've managed your personal finances, QuickBooks is, is a way of doing small business accounting to manage your business's finances. And in QuickBooks, you've got things like vendors that you're, that you're paying bills to, or you've got customers that you're sending invoices to, you've got your bank transactions to download, et cetera, and we help you manage all of those finances. Um, most of the data in QuickBooks, and perhaps this comes from our, our sort of history as a desktop software company, is entered uh, by hand by customers. And they enter things like names and addresses, and so here's a screenshot of, uh, of QuickBooks Online, which is a, a web-based product, and somebody's planning to send a payment to one of their vendors, uh, the Windsor Press Incorporated. And they, they type in all this information, and it turns out that there are you know, tens of millions of businesses here in the United States. Uh, and we've got lots of different copies of the same business data entered by lots of our different customers. And if you want to be able to have a unified view of all of the different interactions with an individual business, whether that be a small business or a large business, uh, you need to be able to have a way of reconciling or deduping or merging or mastering all that different data together. And so the system we've built uh, on top of HBase and Lucene takes this type of data and merges it and dedupes it together. Um, so one, one example of where the data comes from and both where the data actually is used is in, is in QuickBooks. Um, the problem is, is that imagine you've got two QuickBooks companies. So here on the left, we've got QuickBooks company ABC, and on the right, we've got QuickBooks company PQR. And they've both chosen to represent the same vendor or customer or, or, or entity um, in slightly different ways. And we've highlighted in red here, this is actual real customer data on the top, um, and, uh, and, and highlighted in red some of the differences uh, from how two different QuickBooks customers entered the same vendor. Um, now, there's a company called Dun & Bradstreet. Ha who's ever heard of Dun & Bradstreet before? All right. Who's ever bought data from Dun & Bradstreet before? Yeah, well, they're pretty expensive. So if your hands went up, then uh, then, then heard of them. Um, so Dun & Bradstreet is one of the um, one of the many uh, data vendors out there that's that's somewhat of a gold standard of um, of business data, um, uh, especially here in the United States, although they're, they're actually uh, global. And they've got this nice uh, they have a nice algorithm where they actually tap into um, company uh, incorporations and bankruptcies um, and, and chambers of commerce. And they also actually apparently have got deals with FedEx and UPS and Verizon and AT&T. And so as small companies begin to start up, actually the, one of the very first things they tend to do is buy cell phones or they, or they ship or send packages. And so uh, Dun & Bradstreet has got a decent uh, source, and you might even call it a canonical reference set of data for what, what actually is a business um, in the United States. And so we w ha have a desire to map um, and to reconcile um, some of the data that we've got with some data from Dun & Bradstreet. We also, have, we also see things that Dun & Bradstreet doesn't see, um, so they don't, they don't have a, the, the, the total source of truth, but they've got a, a, a decent set of reference data. And so if we go with a sort of, if we trust a, on this bottom a canonical source of truth, uh, that Dun & Bradstreet says that this is Dun's number 0211 something something. Um, this is sort of the, 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 the true name and address of the business. But how can we actually intelligently and at scale match uh, these two different sets of, of vendors into a canonical vendor? So that's one use case or one sort of problem that we're solving here with this system that we built. Uh, I'll give you another example. Um, who here has heard of Mint? Okay, who here uses Mint? 
Awesome. All right. So if, you, if, if you're from my generation, maybe you actually have heard of Quicken and you used it to manage your personal finances. If you're younger than me, you're actually probably using Mint today already. Um, Mint is our online free uh, personal finance product. And the, the, the key uh, value add that Mint provides is that it categorizes transactions automatically. Um, you give it all your usernames and passwords to any bank, credit card, 401k, brokerage, whatever it is. It, it, uh, aggregates all of your transactional data across all those different sources and gives you a single unified view. And we, we do that via um, uh, a little bit of structured XML data interchange with, with banks and financial institutions, although the, actually the vast majority of it is screen scraping. Um, I think there's something like 18,000 FIs that we integrate with, and 17,000 of them are screen scraping, and, and only about 1,000 of them are, are actual like uh, uh, structured data interchange, plus or minus. Um, and what you get back, especially when you screen scrape, are these transaction strings that are kind of gobbledygook. If you've ever read your bank statement, either in printed uh, form or read it online, you'll see all sorts of weird characters. Uh, there's, here's an example from Orchard Supply in, in Mountain View, California, and, and, the, and the view, the, the EW in view is truncated, and you'll see some reference codes, and I, I, and there, I guess there's a phone number in there um, that starts with a 415, and, and, and a bunch of other digits. Um, hopefully, I didn't post. This is from my own personal thing, so I hope I didn't post any my, my credit card numbers here, um, and, and, then a, and a dollar amount. And what we what we do in Mint transaction categorization is we um, parse those strings and do some regular expressions and have some some logic. But then we actually want to determine what the what the actual merchant is, uh, who 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 the who the vendor that the customer spent money at. And there's a variety of different techniques. You can you can use keyword uh, approaches. So you can say, oh, if it's called um, Mel's Dry Cleaners or Sam's Dry Cleaners, well, you can probably guess that it's dry cleaning. Um, it's not restaurant or a coffee shop or, or home improvement. Um, uh, but keywording only gets you so far. Um, you can also go with large uh, uh, national merchants, your Starbucks, your Home Depots, um, your AT&Ts and Verizons of the world. And actually, if you take the top 3,000 merchants um, in the US, we can cover actually over 50% of the transactions just, just, uh, just with 3,000 merchants. But uh, that's not what Mint's about. What Mint's about is about 100% accuracy, 100% coverage um, uh, on, on all of your spend. And so if you happen to go to some small, um, restaurant that nobody's ever heard of before, well, hopefully it's, it's, it's in our, our business directory data. And we need to match those transactional data. And often the, that stuff is, is mutated by the banks, compressed. They remove uh, vowels um, sometimes because it's running over these really, really old systems. Uh, and so we need to be able to match in a, in a sort of a fuzzy or intelligent way against our canonical reference data um, so that we can extract out the actual name of the merchant. So here I've shown Orchard Supply, which is maybe a, a, a bigger or easier one to, um, um, to pick out. And the key thing that we're getting back out of our matching to the merchant data is both the canonical um, sort of um, identifier for the business, and we're getting back what's called an SIC code, um, which is Standard Industrial Classification. It's a United States government um, standard from like the 1970s. There's actually a newer standard called NAICS, which is North America. I don't remember what the rest of NAICS stands for. Um, all these standards are terrible, um, uh, but they're standards. Um, and so uh, uh, you, you, you get these four digit or six digit or eight digit, depending on whether, whether you're using the, the base standard from the US government, which is four digits long, or, or you use one of these extensions that some of the data vendors sell. And so you can determine, oh, OK, so this business was a restaurant or maybe, not, maybe more, even more fine-grained than a restaurant. This is an Italian restaurant or a Mexican restaurant um, or, or, or a coffee shop or home improvement or whatever it happens to be. So determining the category of either income or, or expense is, is hugely important. It's foundational, actually, in all of, our, uh, all of our financial services products because one of the most important things you want to do is you want to ask yourself the question, where am I spending my money and, and how am I spending it? So automatic transaction categorization is another important use of merchant uh, 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 or business data. So now that I've hopefully motivated uh, why it's important or why Intuit bothers to invest in, 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 this, in, in building out a sort of a business lookup service, um, let me tell you about what we've done with, with Hadoop since you're here at the Hadoop conference. Um, so uh, we start with a bunch of data from, a, uh, from one, of our, uh, one of our products that we're trying to solve. And we want to come up with sort of the master uh, canonical reference uh, to, to that data. And so here in this picture, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing, uh, 
done in Bradstreet um, as the canonical source of truth. In fact, actually, we, we use uh, three or four sources of data, but we'll, we'll sort of treat DNB as shorthand for the reference data. Um, and we begin in step one by importing that data um, into uh, HDFS. Um, and we're, um, actually, it was just at the Amazon talk here, and I'll, 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 I'll say we're not running our stuff on the cloud uh, into it. It's a little too conservative to be running our, our, our data in a, in a public cloud, so we're actually, this is, this is our own uh, Hadoop infrastructure in our own data center. Um, and we load that stuff uh, actually from HDFS into HBase. Uh, the very next uh, uh, set of things we do is we actually run United States Postal Address ad Standardization. So um, whether, whether you spell PO box with a P dot O dot box or just PO box, um, we'll, have a, we'll have a higher degree of matching and, and accuracy if we can sort of take all the gobbledygook um, um, U.S. postal addresses that we have and standardize them. Um, not every bit of, of data has a postal address, though. Um, uh, as you saw in the previous example with my uh, credit card transaction to Orchard Supply, um, there was a phone number in there and there was a name, but there wasn't a, a, a postal address. So um, address standardization uh, applies to some of our data, but not all of it. Um, what we do next is we actually run, um, in parallel, a bunch of different uh, matching uh, sort of a system of experts that know how to how to match or score or identify different types of data. Um, so we're looking at names, um, names of people, names of businesses. There's sometimes clues in the data like Inc. or Corp. or LLC if it's a business. Um, phone numbers, especially in the United States, are structured in a particular way. Um, and we also look at email addresses. Um, postal addresses are actually pretty easy to recognize with regular expressions. And so we extract out all the various bits of information, and then we actually have specialized um, Lucene indexes that we run on our, um, from our MapReduce jobs that um, the phone matcher, the address matcher, the email, um, the email address matcher are all matching against. Each of these uh, matchers returns a score, um, and then the scores are, are, are evaluated by a score combiner, um, which writes back um, the raw scores into HBase. And then, um, and then we have a separate process uh, in our, I, we're using Uzi to, uh, to do the workflow. So we have a, sort of the next step is actually uh, a splicing process where we actually um, take all these various sort of resolved scores, pick the top one typically, and, and say, okay, so this was the canonical truthful value for, um, for what the actual entity was. And here are all the back references, or here, here, here are all the pointers back to the, sort of the original IDs. So if you want to be able to reconcile, um, we provide those back references as well. And then we can send some of that data um, off to downstream applications. And so two of the applications uh, I actually mentioned, both in terms of input data, are actually consumers of this system as well. So uh, QuickBooks is consuming this data um, so that we can provide an autocomplete functionality. So as customers are beginning to type in, um, uh, an invoice or a bill, and they're entering the name of a vendor or a customer, and they begin typing some of the some of the names. Well, actually, we have a, a, a directory of businesses that they can look up um, and and get some sort of autocomplete dropdown type results back. And similarly, for the for Mint, we're providing this this data back um, to the transaction categorization system. So that's the high level architecture of of the system we built. Um, it's uh, and, and and then I've got some more details in terms of what. Um, what we've actually, what we're actually using HBase uh, and Hadoop for. So, uh, an example of the data is, um, it, it, and one of the tables that we're storing in HBase is something that we call a merchant table. Um, an example here from uh, a, a restaurant in downtown Palo, Bal Palo Alto called Crepe Vine, um, which stores a name and an address and a city, state, county, you, um, uh, a website, um, storing a phone number, lat, lat long. Uh, where we got the data from as a source. Um, and then um, we actually have separate category um, hierarchies. So I mentioned this thing called an SIC code, um, or a SIC code. That's the uh, standard industrial classification. It's a four-digit code. Um, each of our different products tends to take um, what are thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of numerical codes and presents them in user-readable formats um, like uh, food and dining um, is how Mint might refer to this particular um, uh, merchant, and QuickBooks Online, QBO, uh, might represent this as restaurants. And then I also mentioned this thing called NAICS, which is a, a newer but also flawed government standard for um, also for basically categorizing businesses. Um, and so that's so the the nice thing about HBase is that you've got these uh, these very very flexible column families, and so we also can then um, 
uh, map where, uh, where things came from some particular source, whether that came from Dun & Bradstreet, whether that came from a user-entered uh, bit of data, um, whether that came from a, a, another data vendor like InfoGroup or, 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 or various other data sources that we get, um, QuickBooks product registration data, et cetera. So that's the, uh, the, the basic schema that we're using in our system. And I'll just I'll take a, 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 a slight detour out of uh, HBase in particular and just share some of the details for what we're actually doing with our, with our MapReduce jobs. Um, so when we, when we actually do the matching, um, I mentioned we're using Lucene indexes to do various lookups. Um, and we, in Lucene, when you, when you perform a query on it, it always returns some set of results rank ordered in a particular order. Um, our mapper side of our, of our job is basically returning some set of candidate um, merchants. So if you have an input merchant A and, that, and, and basically the best possible um, candidates are merchants A1, A2, A3, A4, um, Lucene is giving us some ranking based on its matching, but that's actually not necessarily the exact logic we want to use to pick the best candidate. And so um, on the reducer side, we're actually evaluating some set of candidates and, um, and, and then, and then d spitting out an output score. And every one of our matchers spits out a score between 0 and 1. Um, so it's very easy to, to add them together in some sort of a scoring formula. Not a terribly complex algorithm, um, but, but works pretty well. Um, the other thing that we, that, that we do um, sort of across all of the different types of, of data that we're doing in this, in this mastering and deduping system, um, whether it's names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, or, or any other part, part of information that we're trying to match, is some basic normalization and, and, and string pre-processing. So we are you know, this sort of standard tricks that, that I think everyone uses. Make sure that everything's in the same case, either, either lowercase or uppercase. Um, if you're doing things with phone numbers, we're doing the standard letter to digit conversions. We're either adding con uh, country codes or removing them or, or, or removing hyphens and parentheses, stripping off extensions, those sorts of things. Um, on, on business names, we have some special s handling for, for common suffixes. Sometimes things are corp, sometimes things are corporation, incorporated, LLC. Um, we also have um, some synonyms tables that, we, that we've built. Um, so I.B.M is the same as IBM, which is the same as international business machines. One of my former jobs was at a company called Adobe Systems Incorporated. Nobody, nobody calls it Adobe Systems Incorporated except for employees. Um, everybody just calls it Adobe uh, um, and, or Apple and Apple Computer. And so um, sometimes you actually need um, having some additional, um, uh, additional contextual data actually kn knowing about some businesses and their aliases helps with these types of problems in entity detection, not just the corp LLC and INC type suffixes. And then, um, and then we, our, our address standardizer tends to spit out um, addresses that look like um, 123 North Main. It actually chops off, um, much to my surprise, chops off things like Avenue Street and Road. Um, that's apparently not part of our, 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 our matching. Um, I think the Postal Service would prefer that we put those on, though. So, so don't, don't follow our address matcher's advice on that regard. Um, and then as we're comparing the strings, we're using uh, a couple of standard string distance me metrics. So, um, so we're using um, a combination of the Jacquard and Jaro Winkler um, algorithms. Uh, we're using a library here called OpenNLP, a Java, a Java library which implements uh, a bunch of different natural language processing algorithms. And, and it comes with both of these two things. We actually combine those two um, algorithms together in our, in our string comparisons. And then our final score is, a, is, a, is a, actually a formula. Um, and this is not exactly what it is, but you can try, try to sort of simplify it for the purpose of cramming it onto a slide. There's a set of coefficients that we can actually learn from studying a bunch of input data and training, um, or, you can, or you can sort of hand tune, um, which look at things like um, what's, the, what's the output between 0 and 1 from the, from the phone, phone number score? What's the output from the, na uh, from the name of the business score? What's, or, or the output from the address score? We also have email address and some other components as well. Um, and, uh, and so here we're giving more weight to the phone scorer. Um, so our belief is that two businesses that have the same phone number, um, even if they have very different names, are actually very likely to be the same business. Um, uh, there was an there was a great Indian restaurant in Mountain View nearby um, that went by these two names, like Southern Spice Indian Restaurant and like India, India Bistro. And if you actually look at the, the string distance between Southern Spice Bistro and whatever, they, they, they look um, you know, completely different. But um, because they have the same phone number, we give a lot more weight to the, to the phone number um, because those phone numbers don't tend to get recycled uh, very frequently. Um, but uh, but you, ought, you might find that two businesses share the same address um, 
and, and so we might give a little less confidence to, um, to, to businesses that, ha that, that have um, a similar address. And in fact, many, many businesses share the same name. Um, and so um, we, 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 give, we give much less weighting and, and importance to, to the business name. All right, so the last part I wanted to talk through um, was uh, about um, how we used HBase to, 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 uh, to build the system and, and, and what we did to speed things up. And so our sort of initial approach was a little bit naive. And, um, and through some, uh, just a few weeks worth of optimization, we actually got about a 10x speed up. Um, a, a sample run of about a million um, things in our system, uh, which used to take 10 hours, uh, actually takes about one hour. Um, and, uh, and then writing back uh, in, in a sort of a different type of, of, of computation that we're doing where we've got about 30 million, 31 million records. Um, it used to take about four and a half hours, and now it's about, about 30 minutes, also about a 10x reduction in speed. And so these are, um, these are on sort of a relatively small 20-node uh, Hadoop cluster. We actually have HBase installed on only five of the nodes, and so we can use all the nodes for mapping and reducing, but any, any HBase queries or writes actually end up, um, in, end up using the five nodes that have HBase installed. Um, so what did we do, and, and what, what optimizations can I share with you in terms of, of things that you can learn? Um, so Something that's, that, that, that was very particular to our problem, but maybe can be useful to you, is, is partitioning. Um, so uh, we initially started off with um, uh, matching uh, names and addresses and things like that with one big, honking, gigantic Lucene index. And so Lucene was hitting the disk, and we, we buy cheap disks. Um, and so disks are not super fast. And for every, basically for every query, um, Lucene was hitting the disk. And what we did is we, we, did, we, we had something actually really, really, really simple. We took um, all of the, uh, all the data from our sort of canonical reference data, and we split it into 50. Well, actually, slightly more than 50, because Washington, DC, and Puerto Rico, and other things, um, so you know, 52, 53 states, so to speak. Um, and uh, we split it and generated separate Lucene indexes for each, um, e each part of the partition. Um, and then we also similarly split all of our input uh, by state as well. So if you take uh, data for a particular state, for example, New York, um, then um, we're, we're only, uh, we're doing this sort of um, segment or segmenting or partitioning, so we only have to evaluate um, business, potential business matches in the same state. Now, why do, why do we split by state and not by city or zip code? Well, sometimes actually businesses move um, from one city to another or from one zip code to another. And so generally speaking, uh, if particularly a local business, generally speaking, a local business never moves a state. Uh, that, that's sort of a, that was one of our optimizations was that, um, and I, I'm sure there are cases where um, people are on the border of one state to another, but um, if, if a restaurant decides to expand and, 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 and move, to, move down the street or move, move to the next town over, sometimes the, the city or even the phone number will change, but the state tends to stay the same. And so by partitioning by state, we actually are able to have a high degree of accuracy without, um, um, without, without losing much, and we get to run 50-something um, you know, jobs in parallel. Um, so that, that was the, pr probably the most important optimization we ran. Uh, the next optimization we did um, had to do with, uh, with some HBase configuration tuning that we did, um, where because we were doing basically full table scans for, um, for, for most of, our, for most of, of, of this Uzi pipeline, um, we, we chose to set the, um, the H, H table scan object. Um, there has a set caching option when you can read up on the API. Um, we set it for our, ours the value to 500, um, which tells uh, tells it that we want 500 rows at a time to be returned to the, to the client. Um, you can't just willy-nilly set this value super high um, because um, depending on what you're doing with the rows that are being returned, uh, you, can, you can basically get timeouts if you take too long to process uh, that, those, those, those groups of rows. And so, um, so in our particular example, 500 was the, was the right answer. We also, um, we also turned off this cache blocking feature um, in large part because we're doing full table scans and the basic, the basic advice in HBase says this, this is a, a best practice to, to, um, to use. And in fact, that, back, that cache block churning um, re reduction gave us some, some speed up. Um, 
And then uh, we set a, uh, um, this, this uh, HBase region server lease period to about 10 minutes. Um, that was tied in some part to, um, to how long uh, each of these different um, uh, partition jobs ran for. Um, clients have to report back in um, to the, um, the region server within a particular period of time, otherwise they're considered dead and then um, that job will, will get, or that task will get restarted. Um, a, uh, a, another sort of simple standard optimization, and this is maybe perhaps more of a Java optimization than it is a Hadoop optimization, is um, if, you, if you deal with, with HBase, you tend, to, you tend to do these bytes, um, dot two bytes all the time back and forth, and so we just cache those things in public static final. Nothing particularly um, uh, uh, revolutionary here, but uh, a, a good best practice, and it also actually improves the, uh, the readability of the code as well. Uh, and then, um, uh, uh, another sort of a, a good practice to follow is um, is using table map reduce util, which is a, um, a a standard class that's provided that really makes it convenient and actually more importantly performant um, when you're doing um, both huge uh, sort of reads from HBase and or, or writes to HBase, whether it's a source or a sync. Um, if you, if you actually go, if you come from a sort of a traditional uh, relational database background um, and, and you think about HTable as a, as, as a database and you open up a, a query and you and basically do, do um, a bunch of, of reads and stuff, it actually is, is, is pretty inefficient. And so using table map reduce util um, makes, a, makes a huge improvement. Um, similarly, when you're writing back, um, don't use, um, um, don't use an htable.put um, from the mapper or reducer. That's terribly slow. Instead, you should use uh, context.write, um, which makes a, a sort of a huge performance improvement. Um, and then uh, the last set of best practices I, I had to share were had to do with uh, basically also some convenience uh, uh, methods. We use um, we have our own little small class. I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you the implementation on the next slide. It actually isn't very long. Um, called HBase Utils, um, and um, and we and we have functions like get column value or get column value as double or get column value as long, um, which do uh, uh, some, some of the conversions for you so that you, your code becomes much more readable. Um, the actual implementation of the code is, uh, um, is, is pretty straightforward. We're doing these bytes dot two strings and we're doing double dot parse double or long dot parse long. Um, and, uh, and that way by, by wrapping up some of the sort of the, the, the standard um, result.getValue calls that you have when you're dealing with uh, HBase result objects. Um, it, it just makes, it makes the, the, the code, I'll go back, um, it makes the, the code a, a heck of a lot more readable than having a bunch of HBase um, result.getValue um, and, and all these bytes.toString and, and, and bytes. Dot, um, uh, uh, the, the, the other way conversion um, uh, calls back and forth. So uh, I'm, I'm a little, I'm done a wee bit early, um, I, so I wanted to say thank you, and now I have a chance to uh, ask for some questions. Um, and there is a microphone here. I've been asked to, ha to have you guys grab that mic and ask your question on the mic so that it can uh, record your question. Yeah, I was just wondering in terms of uh, use, you mentioned businesses. <clears throat> what about the lat and long data? Um, how are you using that? versus like phone numbers and things like that, and has that evolved and changed over time to help with data quality? Uh, so, so latitude and longitude, we, we rarely tend to get um, uh, in any sort of, um, we, we only tend to get, we only tend to receive latitude and longitude data from things like mobile devices. Um, when we're getting credit card transactions, when we're screen scraping that stuff, or when customers are entering data, they tend to enter in data things like regular US postal addresses and they don't tend to enter lat and long. So um, when we have a mobile device and it's actually transmitting the, the, the user's GPS, that tends to be very, very useful. It also is useful for things like doing a, a radius search, give me all pizza restaurants in a five mile radius from where I am because I'm really hungry right now. Um, so lat long, we, ha we don't really use it uh, to improve our data quality at all. We, are, we, we more use it um, for the downstream applications. Uh, my name is Ali Hussain. I work for this company called Te uh, Telenac. And we have some of the same problems you have. We have data coming in from multiple sources. We have to dedupe, curate, and categorize that and probably create a, a, a set of data that is condensed. Uh, one of the things you said was if the name is a little bit different, then probably the address is the same. 
and that's how you infer or uh, boost the score to figure out. We have uh, problems on both sides. So if the name is way different and the address is this, the very same, it might not necessarily be the same business. So the example is doctors. Mm -hmm. So you have like this board uh, address or board phone number. So everyone shares the same phone number. Ev everyone has the same uh, address, but they are distinct businesses. So that's one. Right, we have it in malls also. Right, exactly. So th there is a containment problem as well. So there are POIs within or points of interest within a point of interest. Right. So you have like this b gigantic shopping mall. And you have uh, small shops within that. So th that is one side of the problem. And then on the other extreme, we have uh, the same business changing their, their name a little bit uh, differently. In some cases, fairly differently, but they are the same business. Have you done any optimizations? Is there anything that you have kind of worked towards? Uh, it's a hard problem. Um, we, we, we struggle with it, too, is the sort of the shortest possible answer. Um, it's to the extent that you can get other more persistent bits of information from your, from your data sources, whether it be directly from the customers or from the, whoever you're, you're acquiring your data from, um, URLs or Facebook addresses or, or, or Facebook logins. Or there, there are certain types of data that tend to, tend to be a little bit more persistent, a little bit more reliable than, um, than names and addresses. And those sorts of things um, tend, uh, we can sometimes use to break ties. But um, as with everything in, in, the, in these systems, um, they're all probabilistic, and they're all returning some confidence score. And so every one, every one of our um, steps in our deduping process returns some sort of score. We might choose to say, oh, um, things with a score of 7, well, let's, say, let's say it's had a score of 10, 7 and above, or maybe 6 and above, um, we're willing to say, OK, that's a match. But man, 5 and below, that stuff is probably garbage and highly suspect. And so we'll maybe create new entities um, for the things that, that, that had a low, a low match score, because we decide we'd rather, we'd rather have some duplication um, in the system uh, than, than accidentally merged together two nodes that we ought not merge together. So the other question is, of course, uh, this will lead to some duplication, which is um, something that you don't want. Like, let's say there was a, a gap at uh, Stanford Shopping uh, Center and the Stanford Shopping Center itself. Is there anything, or do you, you just take a business decision at a point and say, uh, this is the best we can get, and we'll keep improving, but th this is what it is? Yeah, the only thing you can do is ask, um, if you want to have 100% confidence, is ask the customer. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you have some sort of interactive, interactive application, you can ask the customer, basically, are, are these two things the same, or were, were you actually shopping at that gap instead of this gap? Uh -huh. um, and if you're willing to interrupt the customer or ask them those questions, then you can, get, you can, you can give yourself 100% confidence, because in theory, well, anything the customer tells you is true. Even that is probably actually not really true, but um, we can trust Except the customer. Yeah, 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 yeah. From a business perspective, it must be true. Um, and, and, and beyond that, yeah, um, it, it's uh, you, you, everything is probabilistic. Okay. Thank you. Hi, um, I have two questions. You mentioned you were uh, using uh, Uzi. Uzi. Uh, my first question is. How often does this process happen? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you only have to do it when you ingest new data or just an update in that data set, right? Right. So the process that actually I describe here is, is only roughly daily. Um, uh, the, um, there, there are parts of our, of our system that run in real time, um, but the, uh, the, the sort of the workflow in the system I described here runs no, no more often than once a day. OK. So could you talk more about um, your um, adoption of Uzi uh, in, in your platform? What was your pain points, uh, probably around um, monitoring and, and getting the thing going. And so the, the, the shortest answer is that Uzi is actually relatively new um, in, in, our, uh, in our workflow. We, we switched to Uzi because we had this horrible handcrafted workflow that made absolutely no sense at all. And so we've actually only switched to Uzi really in the last month or so. Um, in fact, when I first submitted slides to this talk, we, didn't ha we weren't using Uzi. And so, um, so uh, I can follow up with you afterwards um, and, and get you in touch with some of the engineers on our team okay. uh, who, who've got a very, very fresh experience with using Uzi. Thanks. What's the total size of the data set? What's the total size so of the data set? I think you said 31 million records? Um, no, uh, so that, no, that's just one of the various uh, uh, consumptions. Um, th I, we, so, Intuit has about 50 million customers, um, and we 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 manage or we our, our customers transact over over a trillion dollars a year in in transactions, either on the Mint or QuickBooks or other 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 sides of the business. Um, in terms of bytes, we don't I don't think we really disclose how many unique records or unique transactions. Uh, um, so it, those are some ballpark numbers: 50 million customers. Um, 
a trillion a year in, in spend, um, billions of, of sort of, of uh, billions of actual transactions and, and, and I would say hundreds of millions of entities that we're, that we're, that we're referring to. Well, what about just in the system that you described here? So HBase, for example, in that 20 node cluster that you talked about. In that 20 node cluster, um, I think there are um, a couple hundred million entities in there, um, two or three hundred million entities um, in, in that ballpark. Yeah. An unrelated question is, uh, you mentioned you know Intuit's too conservative to move this to cloud. Is that uh, you know? Do you see that changing? Uh, what's your view on that in terms of uh, you know? Are you considering going to AWS? Uh, do you think they'll happen in the near future? Never. And what are some of the specific concerns around that? We're, um, so, so our, our customers' financial data is some of the most sensitive data to them and to really anyone. It's not like your, your, your search history, which you might actually also consider sensitive, but who you spent money with um, uh, or, or what, your, what your taxes were. Um, it, it's, it's some of the most sensitive data uh, in the world. And so um, our customers use our products and trust us because we've, over the last 20, 29 years have, have demonstrated to them that we, we haven't screwed up with their data. Um, so even though it might cost us more to run our own data centers than to use something like Amazon, um, we're, uh, with our customers' uh, financial data in particular, um, that's not going to change. We, now, we are using um, Amazon EC2 uh, in other cases. So I, I'll give you one example. Um, in TurboTax, uh, there is a there's a feature called Live Community, which is a message boards, a sort of a user, a community supported message boards where um, regular old taxpayers ask questions of each other, and then these wonderful taxpayers volunteer their time to answer questions to each other, like, can I claim my 36 year old son as a dependent? And the, and 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 these people volunteer their wonderful time, um, and so Live Community. Um, is a, is, a, is a system that we use and it handles like something like, uh, during tax season we did over six billion searches uh, on, on live community as customers were, were, were using the product. That's actually all hosted in, in, um, in Amazon EC2 because it doesn't contain any of the tax data. Um, it's none of the tax forms, it's none of the W2s or the 1099s or none of the sort of the, either the intermediate or the, or the resultant data. It's sort of this other thing and we feel very comfortable using the cloud to do things like that um, uh, and and maybe over time we'll find other opportunities to use the cloud because it's much more cost effective. And if you think about something like taxes, it's, it's incredibly spiky. And like, we don't need a gazillion servers lying around on April 16th. We need them on April 15th. Um, and so we, we'd love to use the cloud for as much as we can. But um, at this point, we're much too um, concerned about maintaining our, our, uh, the, the promise we've made to our customers. Um, and we aren't yet convinced that we can safely put our data on the cloud. Okay, I think I have time for one more question, and then I got to let you guys go for lunch. Okay, last question. So, I mean, I'm a Quicken customer for the last six, seven years. So I didn't see Quicken up there, but I'm assuming the transaction categorization applies to Quicken as well, right? So uh, Quicken is a desktop product, right. and so yes, Quicken actually calls into a web service API that um, that that we provide that basically does transaction categorization. And so there's there's a couple different ways where your data. Um, can, can flow from the financial institution into Quicken. You can either flow through our servers, um, and, and in which case it gets categorized before it comes to your desktop, or um, in some cases you can actually directly download from your bank or your FI into your desktop, and we actually post it to our, our, um, our REST APIs and then um, return a, a, a category, and that's completely transparent to the, to the user. Okay, great. Uh, just another quick question. So you showed up the Lucene product. What was that? I mean, I didn't really get that. Oh, so Lucene, Apache Lucene is an open source, um, uh, basically search index uh, uh, library. And actually, there's a really excellent um, framework built on top of Lucene called Solar, S-O-L-R. And actually, most people are using Solar because it, it, it gives you so much more functionality. It's a sort of a client server model, and you can, you can basically throw searches at it and, and get back um, uh, search index type of results. We, have, we happen to be using Lucene from within the Hadoop infrastructure rather than Solar because um, as a library, uh, Lucene is sort of a, a, a better library type uh, uh, access. Um, so you can just check out Apache Lucene. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to take some more questions privately if you want to come up here individually. Thanks.